Tschüss. Academic Publishing is big business with an estimated worth of about 10 billion with a B US dollars a year. And that's kind of a problem. Here to talk about why, amongst other things, is my friend and fellow librarian, M. Johnson. Thank you for joining me, Em. You're very welcome, Luke. Thanks for your invitation. Of course. Uh, so let's start with a little bit about you and what you do. We are both academic librarians, uh, but I work in student support and you work in... Research Publications Management. Okay, so what does that entail? All right. So um, my role as uh, what's called an Institutional Repository Manager, and I'm going to start calling that an IR from now on, um, is to essentially gather and make available all of the research publications or research outputs of my institution um, and make it discoverable to the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, essentially meeting uh, many of the mandates for current Australian government-funded research, as well as just basically meeting the need of the public access to research knowledge. Okay. So for those who are not familiar, I guess, um, part of a university academic's job like a lecturer is to research and produce publications and that's what we call the publish or perish model mm. uh, which we will talk about i hope mm. um, so your job is to gather all of those research publications from your institution's academics and make them all accessible and available in one spot as much as we possibly can, yeah. It's actually difficult, depending, um, bizarrely enough, on the technology that we're using. Um, okay. That's a whole other conversation, <laughs> if you like. But essentially, um, there are repository bits of software that, are, that allow for what's called a self-submission kind of deposit your publication. So this is the author. Once they get informed by the publisher that their paper's been published, the next step is to deposit the earlier version of it, mm -hmm. which is another conversation we'll get to, um, into their institutional repository, the right. IR. And that's the easiest model. And we're currently working on one where we actually have to chase that up actively. Okay. So, but, yeah, essentially that's what it is. We're gathering um, all of that at my institution's publications and we're walking, working hand in hand with the research office to do this. And it's a big part of measuring um, my institution's research impact yep. um, and it's actually a requirement that we audit that in a formal way um, for government funded research as well. So university funding depends on having this research be measurable, measurable, findable, right. um, but also uh, impact. It's it's these are these are sort of intersectional conversations in a way because the impact of a university's research is about how much is it informing and advancing the that field of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, how much attention is it garnering? How many? other researchers are citing that research in their own research in return, right. right? So these metrics are something that all universities have to keep track of. And so um, an IR and my job as an IR manager is to make sure that we have as full a picture of that as possible in terms right. of the outputs that our university is creating. Right. So that gives you sort of, I mean, compared to me, a pretty high level of authority to talk about what I want to talk about today. Which, I hope so. <laughs> which is, well, <laughs> compared to me, because um, I'm nowhere near qualified enough to talk about this, but it is something that I'm interested in, and that is pretty much what it says in the title, everything wrong with academic publishing. So let's start with what the academic publishing process is, going from a researcher, I guess, having an idea or a hypothesis that they want to test mm. through to, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, uh, yeah. No, no. It's through to getting it into the IR and having it in a journal that can then be accessed. Yeah, yeah, good. What, what we're referring to right now is called the research life cycle. Um, 
Um, now this is time for me to make some disclaimers because okay. um, it's really important that I make sure that people understand the context of my role. I'm actually not a researcher. Um, and for the most part, and this is where some um, of the complexities of my role come to play, is I'm really only getting into this at what many researchers would think of as the very end part of the research life cycle where they have got the idea, got the funding, done the research, collated it, tested it, all the methodology, written up results, gotten a publisher to accept it, and then published it. I mean, the research life cycle, as far as the researcher continues on as well but they have less to do with it after that it's more mm -hmm. after that it's measuring how much attention that garners but i'm coming in as a non-researcher but a publications manager at the end so it's quite likely that at some point i'm going to make some ranty statements which don't necessarily <laughs> <Please> do <laughs> which don't necessarily always gel with the actual reality because i can't talk to the experience of a researcher yeah. but i can certainly talk to the experience of a librarian who manages their publications and witnesses what it is that researchers have to go through to get well, to that point. That's the aim of this channel, is to talk about information as yeah. a commodity, as a thing that we can consume and engage with. Yes, so, and there are interactions with it and the impacts of it and the implications mm. of how it gets used, for sure. And create. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> Let's talk about that that research life cycle. Mm. Life, that, I almost said lifestyle. Um, the research lifestyle, it's... Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a research lifestyle. It's just like, sit down the bitch and research, bra. You know? <laughs> let's, let's talk about it. All right, so... Um, I can talk with authority about some sections of it, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm really keen to talk about some of the things that I'm questioning right okay. now as a research publications cool. manager. So as a student support librarian, I get asked about the peer review yeah. what is peer review why do i need as an undergraduate to find peer-reviewed stuff yeah so can you provide a succinct answer to that <laughs> um yes i can i can certainly describe peer review and this is something that you will already be teaching your students yeah. but i'm going to summarize it essentially what peer review is is a a body of the researchers or the authors' peers, people who are also authoritative and acknowledged in that field of research, basically come together, read an early version of the paper that they're intending to publish. Um, they're pulled together and they provide this uh, service on behalf of a publisher who wants to publish the journal, the, the paper. Um, they will look through the meth methodology it's the assertions, um, the the quality of the research and the methodology and the and the kind of the end result in the output, and they will decide whether a it contributes to that body body of knowledge in a meaningful way. Does it also um, cite its sources correctly? Uh, are the ethics of that those statements and the methodology covered they mm -hmm. basically decide is this a worthy edition uh, does it meet the standards of a piece of research to right. be published so that's peer review um, once the paper goes through that and has the sign off from peer review there'll be some suggestions made which is part of the editorial process mm -hmm. so the peer review kind of adjustments and suggestions, the editorial suggestions, and then after that, the paper's published. Right. A bit of argy-bargy, but yeah, that's essentially what happens. Peer review is being reviewed by right. a body of peers in that area of knowledge, basically. Cool. That wasn't a succinct That's answer. all right. We got it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got the researchers creating research, we have the peers reviewing that research and we have the publisher or the journal that's going to actually print or make available that research. Mm. That is the part that I really want to drill down in today and what is the problem with the current yeah. for-profit model that 
we have mm. at the moment? I can't be succinct in this answer. That's all right. Go. This, this is the question that actually goes to the heart of the what I'm going to call the controversy around academic publishing currently. I have to talk about my understanding of the history of okay. academic publishing. Give us some history. Okay. Uh, because it, it's going to make it clear fairly soon. Academic publishing, let's say 100 years ago, was still at the point where an academic journal, which is really essentially just a publication that was put together by that research body. Usually it's a university or a department of university that kind of pulled together some papers, put them all together in a volume, put it, push it out. It's mm. a not, it wasn't a for-profit. It wasn't a business venture. It was basically the idea was we should maybe get these ideas out there. Right. How do we do that? Hmm. Well, we can attend conferences and they do that. And that's some, one of the methods of dissemination of knowledge. It's kind of a discourse amongst, co amongst colleagues, colleagues. But there's also the publishing the papers. And this was a little venture managed at the university level or maybe at the research body level, if you like. Um, and it was clunky. It kind of got there. But it's essentially managed by boffins. Right. Yep, yeah, right. Um, sorry, no offence. But people who aren't actually in it for a profit, who right. don't have a business head, but do do just want to get their ideas out so there. So the whole and point felt. is to just disseminate knowledge. Disseminate as you say. knowledge, get read, get cited, get cited. It was about. Mm -hmm. It was always going to be about get your your papers read and have them used and get them cited. So academic or research impact. It's always going to be about that. Mm -hmm. What happened after that was. And this is a highly simplified kind of thing. That's okay. Around about 1920 something, um, an entrepreneur, Robert Maxwell, I might be wrong, um, saw an opportunity which was to offer to take over the business of publishing these journals. Um, he's one of them, anyway. Um, he, as a businessman, recognized this extraordinary opportunity to take over essentially the business of binding and disseminating academic knowledge okay. and essentially oversimplifying it the academics were extremely pleased to have someone take over that troublesome business um just the mechanics of it so they just outsourced it outsourced it they outsourced it um what we have now as a result of that decision is that it's just expected that a researcher will give for free the content and the product of their labors to a publisher for free will not for free will not be paid anything for that and that publisher gets this extraordinary content and holds a monopoly over the dissemination of that content and and everything from that point onwards is money in their pocket it's fantastic for academic publishers, and that's the reason why we've got this capital B billion pound dollar euro business happening, um, and it's reasonably obscene. Right, so... That's some history, and it's yeah. some of the answer. Okay, no, that's good. So let's just... So the academic producers, the research... The researchers. Or, okay. Do the research. Okay. The tradition which the university is, pays for? Which the university pays for, yes, as in they're employing the researcher, yeah. they're putting money into the facilities used um, mm -hmm. and the obtaining of the data and the activities around mm -hmm. that, that kind of process. Um, there's another link here where um, we'll tie it all together as we talk, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, a huge part of a research office in, an, in a university's a huge part of their business is to get funding for the research because, right. as we all know, and I'm sorry, this is political now, mm -hmm. universities are being defunded. Yes. Um, the, I don't think that's political. I think that's just factual. It's just factual. Um, research funding comes from a variety of different areas. 
Uh, it comes from private enterprise. It does. Uh, some of uh, a lot of science comes as a result of corporate funding. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, for a university, any source of funding that's ethical is a good source because we're not going to be su su supported and held up. We're not making profits right. in research. We're trying to get knowledge kind of out there and disseminated. Right, right, right. But the only real model up till recently has been the, the um, giving our content for free to an academic publisher um, but everything around that is um, the money is coming from the researcher or the the institution that supports that researcher okay. the Australian government um, provides major sources of funding mm -hmm. so the Australian Research Council the ARC and the NHMRC which is the National Health the and Medical, Medical Research, Research Council, Council. Yes. so these are the two major government based bodies where um, funds can be sourced based on the the winning grant. Mm -hmm. So in order to win this grant, you have to prove that the project that you're working on is truly adding to or investigating um, in an innovative way and com either a completely new area of research or a new aspect of research that's already been done, um, that it's uh, topical, that it's needed, that it's something that will um, serve almost a direct purpose mm -hmm. that can be recognised, that it serves a need. So, so it contributes to what we call the knowledge ecology. That's right, yeah. Essentially, the government will fund the, the gap that is not funded by corporate sources of, of funding mm -hmm. where it's serving that corporate need um, right, right. and that's an oversimplification and possibly an over overly political statement but anyway government sources of, of research funding now it seems fairly logical to me that we we should be allowed to say that anything funded by the taxpayer mm -hmm. the government us should but the public should the outputs of which should be made publicly available Right. All right. Uh, and the government agrees. Mm -hmm. So built into the agreement where you accept the funding, you accept the agreement you make with the grant provider, is this statement that um, research outputs from a, a government-funded project will be made available for public open access for free, mm -hmm. public open access within 12 months. Okay. So this this has been an iterative process to get to this point, by the way. Previous years, ARC and, and, and NHMRC funded grants were basically... The, the language around the agreement was, we'd encourage you to. It would be great if you could. Right. You know, we'd like it because it was understood that it, it actually is kind of complicated to get to the point where you've got... Research both being picked up by an academic publisher and therefore carrying the clout mm -hmm. and the impact and being recognised as a scholarly source, which is also being allowed to be made available for open access by that publisher with whom the researchers or the authors have signed a contract. Okay. Which is signing over their copyright. Right. This is the next conversation. Yeah. So... Bring me back on, on, on the page here. Yeah, let's, let's, I've let's, strayed let's, a little. <laughs> let's, let's just backtrack just a little bit. Um, so once the publisher has published the research, it's not available open access. For, we'll talk about open access. It's not available unless you buy it from the publisher. And that includes the institution that helped produce that research in yes. the first place, Yeah, right? let's talk about the money. Where's let's, the money? Let's follow the money. Let's follow the money. So we've got this situation where there was a, there is a tradition um, that in order for a researcher to advance in their career, the outputs of their research needs to be taken up and disseminated by an academic publisher right. that has clout, that has following, that has um, uh, standing in that field. Um, so that's hurdle one. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, there's a tradition, and it's and it's it's the momentum of this business is such that you cannot turn it around. You can't say all your publishers pay the people who provide your content mm -hmm. because that's just never happened. 
Right. Right. So we've got the momentum and the terrible kind of unmovable established tradition of um, researchers have to have impact and the only way they can do that is to give their content over to publishers so how do how do we that is both um, us as librarians and how do people in the public who are interested in that research how do people who other researchers who are trying to inform themselves and update a body of knowledge how do they access research the answer is through academic journals right so in an, inst- in an institution like in a university, uh, the library's budget, the vast, vast majority these days of yep. the library's budget, which is huge. We're talking millions of dollars. Millions in the of year. dollars. Ask, if you're a university student soon, go and see if you can find out what the library budget is for publications. Um, is spent on subscriptions to academic journals. Let's just pause and think about this for a little while. Universities are paying hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to academic publishers to provide access for their users, for the university staff and students to academic journals. The content of those journals has come for free, been provided to those publishers by academics, but we have to pay to get access to it. So that's one issue. All right, let's issue. just break that down into a very, very simple model if we can. <laughs> so you've got the university paying a researcher to do a research task in addition to other sources of funding, but that comes through the university itself, Ooh. not directly to the researcher. That's true, yes. Okay. Yep. That's the first. There's one flow of money okay. from the government or from the university to the researcher to enable them to, to conduct the research. Okay, so they do the research and then they hand over for free... The output. The output of that research, which could be years of work. Could be. Sometimes it's less than years of work, but certainly a concentrated amount of time, which a researcher, for the most part these days in Australia anyway, has to achieve around the competing priorities of teaching Mm -hmm. and attending conferences Mm -hmm. and maintaining their standing in the field and assessing teaching outputs. And I mean, teaching is a big thing because not only do you have to plan lessons, you have to prepare them, yeah. deliver them, and then you have to, this was, this is, this is a, uh, I know this is a bugbear for a lot of people who will be watching, uh, marking. Marking, that's marking what I meant. Marking takes yeah. up so much time. Yeah, um, and it really deserves as much concentrated, um, focused effort as possible because essentially the, the, the duty that a teacher has to their students is to make sure that the students can come through the process right. of learning. Absolutely. Not all teachers at a higher education level get that yeah. but um <laughs> we can see why in a sense they're competing against a whole lot of yeah. other priorities. so so the researcher hands the output of their research over to this academic publisher mm. for free they for get free. nothing for that the publisher then publishes that they get nothing monetarily for it no let's well, this is the money yeah, trail yeah, that we're yeah. following so they um so then the publisher takes that and makes it available either in a print journal or online yeah. through their various channels. That's right. And then if a if another researcher wants access to that first researcher's yes. uh, output, they have to pay for either the article mm-hmm. by itself mm-hmm. or they have to buy the journal. Or subscribe to or the subscribe journal. Or subscribe to the journal. Or they have to already be stab- an established paid researcher employed in a university. And where the, the university, that other university. The university is the, yeah. pays the subscription into the journal. So this Let is, me just, just, oh, go on, sorry. just backtrack a little here. Don't forget although also that um, the, the, the value add that publishers are providing to the process of bringing some research to published output is pulling together the peer review process. But mm. let me tell you something. Peer reviewers don't get paid they for that. They don't get paid. They are voluntary. They're voluntary. So are editors. Yeah, yeah. Apparently so. Um, essentially, they're doing it for prestige and recognition and these are not bad words, by the way. I'm not using them. Oh, absolutely uh, It's not. necessary for a senior researcher to be recognised as contributing to their body of or their field of work. That includes editorial duties and contributing as a peer reviewer. However, they don't get paid for that. They offer that 
that time and that energy on top of all of the other competing things that they have to do as a researcher. So yeah. r- academic journals or academic publishers, shall we say, are, are just raking in free peer review, free, free content, free research attention. They are working hard behind the scenes to produce a polished and dis- disseminate a polished kind of output. However, they've been riding this free wave of content and editorial activity um, for They essentially generations. get a product for zero input. Yeah. And then they reap all of the That's profits right. associated with that when they sell it back yeah. to the people who produced it. Yeah. So we've got this thing going on, and it's been co- the term was coined uh, actually in Holland by a consortium of academics at one point years ago as a is a, a sort of a double payment, a right. Double payment issue where universities are paying their researchers to do research, mm-hmm. and then paying an academic journal to buy the content of those or the outputs of those back in the in the form of a subscription to a journal, a double payment. Mm-hmm. A double payment is already a pretty much scandalous situation. Right. I'd like to talk fairly soon about the triple payment. Let's do that. Yeah. So the triple payment. The third payment comes from um, the decision of academic funders to say, yes, damn it, publicly funded research should be made available to the public within 12 months for free, open access. I think I see where you're going with this. Yeah, right? So this is actually language written into the sort of the the agreement that a researcher makes with a a source of funding or the funder in order to uh, get that funding. They say, yeah, yeah, we'll ensure that this is made available for open access. It's called open access within 12 months. So academic journals said, right, we can help you do this. All right. I can see that your funder requires for you to make this open access. We'll do that for you. We will basically launch it and anyone going to the journal website or um, mostly it's an online access mm-hmm. thing, yeah. um, trying to access the article will land on the page at that journal's website and, and see that they can download it for free. Isn't that awesome? But well, I'm going to ask you to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases. That's the worst example, but certainly mm-hmm. multiple thousands of dollars for that one piece of output, that one article to be made open access. Wow. A triple payment is journals, publishers, excuse me, publishers saying, we'll help you make that open access, but we need to be paid to do that because of all of the extra work that we have to go into and because of the licensing and because of the, you know, we've got to hold a market share mm. um, so that, you know, we don't lose our... All very reasonable share. stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if, if, the, if the journal loses its, sort of loses face or kind of is, is just made too easy to access, then what, po- what possible prestige comes to an author who publishes with us? So, mm. you know, it's in your interest to pay this money. Universities are paying three times. In the case where an author of a very important and a popular output is out there in a journal... The university is paying to employ that researcher and provide them access to facilities and give them time and opportunity to pr- produce a research output. The university is paying via the library pub- budgets to subscribe back into that journal. And then guess where that triple payment comes from? It comes from the grant. So... The oh, government, really? the government oh. awards the grant to the university for that researcher. A percentage of that grant is going to be put into paying that journal to make that article available for open access. Wow. So essentially for the layperson, as a taxpayer, we are paying... When the government buys something, it's effectively us buying that thing as a, yeah, a group true. of people. So we are paying three times for that research yeah i don't need it to make it sound too bleak either but as as funding is stripped out of the university sector 
Um, it's got to be made up somewhere. So yeah, eventually down the line, it's essentially um, pay, it's publishers paying lip service to the great noble effort of making knowledge available to the public. Mm-hmm. Um, so this this situation started to sort of be really overtly noticed and essentially, or 10 years ago, so let's say, um, whole consortiums of libraries started saying, there are gigantic bites into our budget being paid as the cost of subscriptions into academic journals go up. Because what what happens when a business discovers it has a monopoly? They'll push their prices up. Push the up prices up. Because why wouldn't you? That's how capitalism works. That's right, it's money. Growth-based capitalism. Um, so that was already hurting Um but it was sort of a bit of a bit of a obscenity that we were also being we as in universities were also being asked to pay money for what the publishers in their glory have decided to term as gold open access right so author pays publisher a fee it's called an article processing fee because it pays for processing the article mm-hmm. an apc so to make that article available for open access, gold open access, triple payment. Um, wow. So the conversation develops from there and reactions have varied. And this is the next part of the conversation. Yeah. This is how do we deal with that and what has happened as a result. We talked a little, well, you talked a little bit about gold open access and how universities, universities are paying three times for that same piece of research. For, for, for government-funded research, where the mandate is that it is made available for open access in, within a 12-month period. So they've got that gold label stuck on it as a qualifier. Yeah. Let's talk about real open access. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Real open access. Let's talk about what, what is... Because as far as the the... This is, I don't like the terminology. I can't think of any better word. They're the user of that research, the interested party, the person who wants to read that research. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of what we are talking about now is really just hidden to them. They just want access to that output. They want to read that research. Um, And there is no better example than what is used in um, a video that I will provide a link for. A little graphic kind of animated video which talks about the aha moment of a researcher who was by the bedside of their sick relative using a hospital Wi-Fi trying desperately to figure out, you know, is there a new research on this condition that my beloved has? Um, uh, Right, there it is. That's exactly what I want to read press download and be asked to pay right. money for accessing it and they just did and it's like 30 bucks a pop yep. and, you know in that one 20 minute session of looking at new research they paid more than 300 dollars wow and the aha that was an aha moment for this researcher it's not a librarian it wasn't a research funder it was a, a researcher <laughs> shit <laughs> So the aha moment, essentially, what's real open access? Real open access is is where, you know, um, money, it's not a profiteering arrangement mm. where the research is made available instantly, openly, for free, for public access. That's real open access where it doesn't have all of the hurdles that you have to jump through. Um, one of the hurdles being, which is worth mentioning right now, because one of the alternatives to a paid subscription model is um, obtaining an earlier version of a manuscript right. where the author still maintains moral rights over their own copyright. Essentially, and I want to try and find and read a section of a standard copyright agreement from an ac- academic publisher so you can sort of see where I'm going with this. But a, a, journal, a researcher will sign a contract with a publisher which gives up all of their copyright all of it wow um and is owned by the publisher um unless this gold open access fee is paid right so that's where they retain they're paying to retain their rights over their works but rights are permanently retained over earlier versions up to and including um the version which is called the 
the accepted manuscript, which okay. which is the version of the work that incorporates peer review suggestions, um, some of the editorial suggestions, but is not um, typeset, mm -hmm. is not branded, and doesn't involve any of the post peer review kind of work that the journal puts in. Right to the version of record, which is the published version. So that earlier version is something that, um, for the most part, an author can retain rights over. So let's look at the scenario where someone has obtained a government grant, public funding mm -hmm. for research, which mandates that they make it available within 12 months of publication. Um, they can make the earlier version available and the publisher without having to pay an, an APC or a gold open access fee, will still keep that version of record closed and under and behind a paywall. Right. But that earlier version is what we're, we're laser focused on now in, right. in institutional repositories because oh, that's okay. the one that we grab. And the model are where you buy, you make that accepted manuscript available, or post print, it's also called. There's a number of different mm -hmm. bits of language. Available via your institutional repository. This is called green open access. Right. Sorry about all of the categories and the labels oh, and the you colors. Oh, love jargon. Uh, we do. Actually, it was the publishers that decided it was important to give it a color. They suggested gold open access because, mm -hmm. you know, gold is a, you know, lovely metal. Um, and so, therefore, we came back at them and saying, well, we're going to make this green open access. Right. Anyway, that, that's my overly simplified, possibly inaccurate <laughs> recall, recalling of something I never witnessed. Real open access, as far as I'm concerned, is the one that doesn't enforce the author or the institution to pay thousands of dollars mm -hmm. for the privilege of making something open access, right. where we grab the earlier version of the accepted manuscript and put it into an institutional repository now. When this started happening, and this was right, like we're talking in Australian terms, in, yeah. in terms of the, the IR sector, about 10 or 12 years ago, okay. um, it, it got legs and started running and there's momentum and all of the universities created an institutional repository so that they could launch preprints right. for open access. Um, the publishers have come back and said, right, well, we're going to insist that, because we own the copyright on the, the version of record, we're now going to rewrite all of our contracts and insist that they, they get signed and that the author agrees that the preprint will go through an embargo period. So you will, you are, they'll say, yeah, you're allowed to, of course you can, you can make that earlier version available for open access, do that. But you can't actually make it publicly accessible for two years. Is that the standard sort of embargo time? It was for a while, yeah. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. But it was for a while, and this was just the next latest blow, the next scandal, the next you know, like obscenity. And as I'm you said, so this angry is, about all this of this. Is a, as you said earlier, this is an iterative process. And it's so an iterative it's all process. These different little baby steps to get from where we were it's, it's, in the twenties yeah, to where we are now. It's access to knowledge, free public access to knowledge, being driven and pushed and lobbied for by mostly. Um, researchers and librarians being pushed back against by and by the publishing business um, and every time a little ground is given and a little ground is gained so we gained the ability to launch earlier versions into IRs and they push back with saying okay but you can't do that for two years after the publication mm -hmm. of the version of record um, and let me just explain what an impact that could have like and I'm sorry for such an emotive, um, mm. glib, if you like, example, but it really does exist. I really will post, give you a link to post up, which yep. is this um, animated kind of storytelling version. The, the person sitting by the bed of, of someone who's terribly ill with, a, with an illness where the, in which there is real... Um, progress being made and, and options and possibilities for new treatments where the research is very new. If they have to pay hundreds of dollars to access the versions of records versus wait two years, what right. are they going to do? Yeah. They're going to pay hundreds of, of dollars. Course they are pay. 
So we pushed back. And when I say we, uh, it sounds noble. Uh, I actually wasn't involved in any of this, but <laughs> universities pushed back, yeah. or at least I think with some clout under finally from the government with the, the funder, the government-funded grants providers um, pushed back and said, no, no, we want no embargo, no mm-hmm. embargo for items for that are launched um, for earlier preprint versions yeah. launched via the Institutional Repository. Uh, and they said, all right, how about 12 months? And that's where we're at. That now. was where the compromise ground was, yeah. That's where we're at, 12 months. We can make, for the most part, by the way, there are always exceptions to all of this. Of course. All right? Some journals are allowing immediate, immediate open access to preprints. Mm-hmm. Some journals are launching new models and we'll talk about that next um but for the institutional repository green open access the vast majority of materials are going to be under embargo for 12 months okay. for that earlier version so for a person sitting next to their sick and dying relative Sorry. in hospital <laughs> we oh, will come up with other op- um, options it's just it's really yeah well, for, for somebody who's not part of an institution yeah, and wants exactly. to get access to new research, say you're a, a backyard inventor or whatever. Yeah, or someone who is with a, an institution who doesn't get an awful lot of money, doesn't get lots of funding for research, but is still supporting researchers as best they can. Right. Um, the option is always there, I believe, to email the authors directly mm-hmm. and get the preprint. Yes, you can. that way. Yep. For the most part. For the most part, there are still always going to be. It's worth reading the fine print on and some of these, and I will if you can, if you want, I can make these available. They're all on the publisher's websites. The fine print of these contracts, believe me, covers that situation too. And And essentially, I'm mostly seeing language around you get to share your accepted manuscript upon publication with a limit, limited amount of people. Okay. Um, how is it policed? I don't know. And yeah. how can they ask someone to do that when it's not policeable? I don't know. But there is an essential core of integrity in most researchers and they, yeah. will, they will not be breaking their contract because that's everything to them. That's their career. That's their cr- career progression is being acknowledged and published by a journal. Mm. So... Yeah, it's a bit of a fraught landscape, isn't it? It's a fraught landscape. There's a lot of high emotion in it. And a lot of the high emotion is being generated by um, the library sector because essentially, I mean, we were about access to knowledge. Right. Right. We get into the role because we're about access to knowledge. Exactly. So, I mean, we are, I mean, it's always interesting when a, pub, a rep from a publisher pushes to get um, a meeting with a library and talk about marketing or promoting their services or their journals because if they've got someone in institutional repositories in the room, the air goes sour really quickly. And I've actually experienced that personally. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that the walls shut down. As soon as I start talking about, do you think maybe you could offer us a discount where... We're subscribing to a journal that we've got our own researchers contributing contributing to. Do you think yep. maybe you could bend that rule for us? So this is some of the models around, some of the complexities and, and, and options around access to knowledge include this negotiating sort of base where the really big universities that have a lot of published journals, especially especially in specific areas where there's cachet, potentially can negotiate for their own subscriptions to be discounted. So if you're a university with a large, say, neurology department, you can get a subscription to the package that includes neurology or just the journal that... Um, It depends, yeah, on the... And you are... You're quite correct. We're talking about... um, um, multiple title um, yeah. uh, 
Bundles. Bundles, thank That's you. That's what they're called. God, God you know package. more about it than me. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, more disclaimers here. It's like I've come into research repositories having not already got a whole kind of years of, of experience of, of managing and purchasing for collections. So I came into liaison librarianship from a project's kind of direction. Yeah. So um, I've not a lot of experience in... Um, handling and recommending and managing subscriptions but um i have uh, had an almost daily conversation with our subscriptions managers right um and this is because quite understandably researchers are more frequently in fact coming to me as the repository manager and saying um, because they're looking for advice, they're trying to decide how am I going to publish, uh, and one of the services that any university's uh, library should be offering its, uh, its researchers is um, guidance mm -hmm. around the publishing experience, at least pointing them towards, you know, the, the, the journals with the highest metrics, yeah. you know. Um, and they'll say, I'm being asked to pay, you know, $1,200 to make this available for open access. Right. Is there any way that you can help us get a discount on that yeah. open access fee? Because um, that's a lot of a, that's a big bite out of my budget. And almost every time, essentially, a librarian's going to have to say, no, we can't. Because we have not got the clout as a university mm. to negotiate down those costs. Right. So this kind of segues into the next little bit that I want to talk about, which is what's happening in Europe at the moment with these consortiums of libraries yeah. and actual governments making decisions about what they will and won't purchase. Yeah, I know. So, I mean, it's an ever and increasingly more complex landscape that what mm -hmm. we're doing, what we're doing is a deep dive now into all of the forking off little implications of yeah. the obscenely high cost of academic publishing. So everyone's trying different things to bring the costs and the, down and the access up. Yeah. So, um, which is not a good money maker. It's not a good money maker, and when you live in a capitalist growth based world, there's just there's no argument to be made. You can't. Yeah. Some of the Scandinavian countries, where, um, let's call it higher education literacy um, and research clout is high, mm -hmm. and and funding into education is is solid. There's like. Uh, a strong, if you like, uh, democratic socialist kind of uh, f government's funding universities really well. Um, and producing really high quality research as well. In some areas, the highest quality research is coming out of these countries. Uh, and what that translates to mean is that these countries where there are, it's a small country with, let's say, five or six um, large universities have grouped the universities have grouped together as a consortium of, of a, a bargaining consortium and said we as a country will refuse to sign these publishing contracts unchanged mm -hmm. we will we will ask for the following clauses to be added so these are the contracts that the researchers sign with the publisher to make uh, accessible their information, uh, their research. And some clauses include no embargoes yeah. on, on preprints. Um, and that is across the board for any journal published by that publisher accessible in that country. Wow. Other, other clauses include we demand just discounts on our subscriptions. Yeah, of course. Based on the fact that specifically for the following journals, a lot of the, the, the recent knowledge and learning is coming from our universities. Mm. But you'll note that when they're, not, they're, not, they're not sort of, they're going so far and not pushing hard because you can't say I demand, um, f I demand that you give us these journal subscriptions for free. Well, yeah. Because you just can't do that. <laughs> because the got, momentum got 100, and the 100 100 years years or so of published, established tradition where you pay for a subscription. Yeah. But, so we're trying to. But we're getting that. a pushback, yeah. And these countries um, have the clout and have the ability to negotiate that because they've got not only a consortium of universities, but their own governments on board mm. and their own government funders on board pushing back against the journal saying, well, we won't publish with you. So. 
the two recent ones that I've read about um, are Germany and Sweden, and they've just got no deal with um, the world's biggest publisher, Elsevier. That's right. Uh, and so they... But it is, in fact, it's called the... Um, it is called the No Deal yeah. um, story. If you search it on Google, Sweden, Just got Grant no Denier deal. in my head going, No Deal. Yeah, yeah. it's great, but it's, it's achievable at... Um, um, on you know where they are because of of the nature of research in that country, the funding sources, the clout, um, the the small relative small size to relatively huge impact of their research. Um, it's it's possible via those kind of mm. yeah. Australia is in a very different situation. Um, we do have representative bodies, so so there's a council of university council of Australian university librarians. Yep. Call. Um, there is a representative body called the um, Australian Vice Chancellors Associated Vice Chancellors. Something there are like there are representative bodies, but they're not stepping up and and able to negotiate these deals because we are such a dispersed population across a gigantic vast country because we are relatively shall we say small research clout to population size um, and the state of government funding and support for research in this country uh, is still based on a market economy right which is if you can prove a profit then you'll get our funding which just makes no sense to me Right, uh, so that is a bit of a bleak landscape. It's a bleak landscape at the moment, and there's pushback, and there's options. Um, and we should talk about that next. Okay, well, let's talk about that now. I think we've we've exhausted we're that one. We're all, we're, yeah. we're there. So let's talk about the the options and the alternatives. So Where do look, we go from here? This, there's, there's this thing. So this, this, this ability, this moral authors retaining their copyright, and moral rights over their content with earlier versions. This is huge. Mm. This is not unprecedented either. In some research fields, there is a long established and unshakable tradition of colleagues inside that research field sharing preprints, preprints. Um, okay. Uh, and with the advent of the internet, at almost at the same time from the 1980s onwards, there was at least one or two shared uh, networks where researchers were just simply handing over their outputs well, that's and sharing. sort of where the internet came from. That's why DARPAnet was invented. That's right. To, to share research. Isn't it amazing that this model has existed for so long and yet has just never had that much traction? It has huge traction in some fields of research. Mm. Um, and I can only really talk about those fields of research I'm used to handling outputs for, so particular to my institution. So astronomy, for example, there are physics and astronomers. They've had a preprint sharing open access server called ArcSive. Okay. Um, previous to that, there were other models exactly like that, serving the same body of researchers. But ArcSive is essentially what you would call an external subject-based mm -hmm. preprint repository. Um, okay. Look it up. I'll spell it for you. I'll put a link in the thingy. Yeah, here we go. Um, so these are physics, um, mostly, mostly sciences, astronomy, based so sharing of preprint uh, research outputs of papers but also of data mm -hmm. raw data um i love the archive model i love talking about it because essentially um it has been established for so long that it just can't be touched right so journals wanting to publish versions of records in that area just don't bother even asking okay. researchers to sign contracts with clauses that disallow them from sharing their preprints because it's there and there's no embargoes on these materials either. So these are not institutional repositories. No. They're not based in a university. These they're are peer-to-peer. -peer. They are peer-to-peer -peer sharing of knowledge and outputs. This is a great thing and we're now starting to see a lot more um, external peer-to-peer preprint servers appearing, serving 
I think pretty much almost all of the research of the of the bigger research areas, okay. uh, including now branching out into the humanities. Nice. Which is just awesome, and it's been so long because there's been no cachet for that. Yeah. Um, very few. This is a problem for all um, humanities-based researchers. Is you, there's very few sources of funding for non-science, which means it makes it harder for them to share outside of the mm. peer review. But so external repositories are starting to break this model. But it's starting to feel to me, and now I'm taking a really, really long view. Okay. That that the model of academic publishing is so broken and so dispersed that we're going to have to start questioning what is really, what is the nature of a journal article? What is a journal article? And why, if it can be subverted by the Mm pre-print, the pre-published, and if the sharing of this knowledge can happen so fast that it becomes really a dialogue that mm. it's not a static object, that it's not a static piece, it's, not, it's no longer paper-based, it's no longer version of record published in a, in a volume journal-based. Yeah. It's now, uh, and, and all academic publishers now will actually launch a, a version of record paper before it's been assigned to its final resting place course, in a volume. Yeah. So it's called an early print or early view, but that's the final version. Mm. So you can access a final version without it having been put into a volume. So these the, these barriers and boundaries are just slowly getting greyer and merging. And a research output now covers a remarkable breadth of items. This is actually a challenge for institutional repositories, by the way, mm. because we were set up to handle the publication, you know, right, the, object, the, the published the object. issue number in the journal. Like. But what about if a researcher, especially in the, in the humanities, what about if a research object or research output is, well, a video or um, an exhibition or, or um, it's a performance or it's... Do you understand where yeah, I'm going? Yeah, absolutely. With this? I mean, so we're seeing this happen. Um, is a piece of data. Yeah. Even in the sciences, it's not published, it's not written up, no. but it's a, it's, a, it's a data set. These items can still, are still, and um, especially with research data, these are materials and items and objects and outputs that are, don't, that where publishers don't have their fingers in them which can be made, organised, curated, preserved, made available and accessible as dynamic, ever-changing items, right? How do we deal with that? How can we make that happen? How how does a a research repository change and adapt to that and therefore make make that happen and be part Mm. of a partner in that sort of process? This is this is it's happening already, but also <clears throat> I think what's happening is it, it's leading to, in, in the long term, it's eroding the, the validity of the published paper as, as a way of disseminating knowledge. Right. I'm sorry, but this has got to be a good thing. Because, Don't apologise. Because I mean- academic publishing is broken. It's an obscenity the amount of money that publishers make for, for free, for free content and free peer review. It's, it's absolutely wrong that researchers have to base their careers and their um, progression and their promotion in academia on research impact based on that model. So something has to break it. Yes. Um, and I mean, talking as... An information professional and as someone who is passionate about the, the the knowledge ecology, more information being more accessible by more people more often is yes. always a good thing. It's always a good thing. Look, I mean, I have to, the thing about librarians is right that we are our business is doing ourselves out of a job because essentially, or if you like, our business is now. You, can't, you cannot simply define a librarian as somebody who manages a collection or somebody who... Uh, what we do is we try to make it easier and, and more accessible for people to act to, to learn 
and attain knowledge yeah. and pass it on. That's our job. So if my job as a, research, as a repository manager is to do myself out of that job and to drop the repository and, mm-hmm. and help move research scholarly communication across to a different model which is not based on the publication and I'm going to run at it. Yeah. But it, we are a way off that. And the reason I know that is because when I talk to my own institution's research managers, they're still talking about, well, we've got to make sure that our researchers publish with the journals that have the highest impact. Because there's still that prestige associated with that because there's traditional just, publishing there's model. This, there's this, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the word that is the opposite to momentum? There's this... Stagnation? Stagnation is one of them. There's this terrible weight and mass and drag inertia is inertia, inertia. Oh, um and it's based on this just this everyone knows that the way that you get ahead as a researcher is to get published by spring and nature i'm name calling now <laughs> sorry we dropped elsevier's name in the before, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. We're, is we're to get all... published by one of the big four publishers who are the big four publishers by the way i can't rattle them off the top of my head elsevier's one yep spring and nature's the other and then we've got Wiley. Wiley, is, are they? maybe they're mostly textbooks. Uh, we can edit this in. <laughs> okay, I'll put a. We'll put a There's graphic. A It'll make this all pretty. I'm two beers in. There is an. Is it a monopoly? It's an oligopoly. Mm. There's four. It's like fast food. There's four. Oh, here we go. First year economics. Oligopoly. Economics. Very oily. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> not not oligosaccharide. Uh, this is this is the FODMAP. This is the FODMAP <laughs> version of, okay. of um, publishing. So there is, it's like fast food. There are, or yeah. telcos even. There are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A very small number of companies that control the entire landscape. Yeah. Um, They've got their hands in each other's pockets. They collude. They collude. Um, they basically, if you read one publishing contract from Elsevier and compare it to one from any of the other two or three publishers, they're almost word for word exactly right. the same. So they're all basically developing the same approach to holding for as long as possible onto that cachet. Yeah. I mean, all right. Because of course they do. There's because money of course involved. Because there's that. obscene amounts of money. You should see the things that some of these publishers do at library conferences. You know, it's terrible. What, what do they do at a library? I've never been to a library uh, conference. Look, there are library conferences. I'm probably never going to be allowed to go to another conference after this. <laughs> but um, Shh, This is only between us. Nobody else sh- needs to know. But there are parties thrown by by pub- academic publishing reps um, at in the evenings mm-hmm. of, of a week long conference, um, and it's fully catered and like free booze flowing, and in some of the best sort of. You always want to go to like a Vala if it's in Sydney. Sorry, not Vala, Alia in oh, Sydney, yeah. right? Because um, you'll get to be on the roof space, party space of the Museum of Modern Art. Ooh. Um, at the docks there and you're being fated by publishers and I just look all right I'm not that noble <laughs> of course I'm gonna go and some of yeah. the I mean some of my best friends are in academic <laughs> publishing um I I have so much respect for people who and I I can I won't name drop but there are people who have left academic publishing in order as mature age students in order to do librarianship studies and get into librarianship and in at least a few cases um in private they've said to me it's because I can't bear it yeah and I need some ability of purpose and I can't I can't really and I'm not claiming any noble ground I mean that's a highly faulty kind of suggestion to make that librarians are librarians because we like nobility of purpose but who doesn't it's nice to have purpose Providing that's access. part of what this is for me is <laughs> teaching nursing librarianship you know the the the, the public the the professions that provide access to knowledge and learning and and help help sort of move that along but anyway that's devolved into a completely other i was going to get there at the end of the two beers but look there are alternatives there is a huge ever-changing approach to dissemination of knowledge Mm. um these are all reasons why it's so important to push back against 
um, attempts to privatise the internet, which is why it's so important to stay alert and be aware of public policy that's government policy that might somehow lock down or privatise um, access to not pub just published information via the internet, but um, giving up your pri- right to privacy, mm-hmm. giving up your right to you know manage your. It's all of these things are connected. It's about the internet represents both you know this extraordinary access to free information and learning and this sped up process of of, of educating the population, mm-hmm. but it also at the same time, as a result, represents this extraordinary business opportunity that yes. people want to get their hands on and turn it into money. Uh, and that's all fine. I can't have, have to accept that I live in a, you know, capitalist society. But when it comes to research, um, I think some of these things, there has to be a compromise. Yes. You know, uh, and universities, research managers and research funders and governments really need to try and break away from some of these hard-worn tracks of established recognition of prestige and find it elsewhere, reward those of their employees, researchers who are putting free time into peer review and editorial, reward and accept and acknowledge and measure um, the non-traditional research um, outputs, the activities that are about about exploring and disseminating it's it's like the sciences for for reasons that i can't go into now they they kind of are well supported by universities and it's easier to get into a prestige journal if you're in science it's it's easier to have your activities recognized and rewarded and therefore your your teaching time versus your research time balanced well you know that negotiation it happens well because it's very easy to show your impact but for people in the non-sciences areas um, they need time to develop ideas and be innovative and push push the boundaries of their lo- their learning and knowledge and share with their peers as well as teach and mm. if it's all based around Having to f- having a re- individual researcher to prove their worth to the university by showing their research impact, and the it's just impossible for people in those areas. So, any yeah. any alternatives to publishing <clears throat> is going to help that. Wow, that is a lot to think about. Yeah, we hey, really broke, obviously... <laughs> we broke into a lot of areas. <laughs> you've you've obviously put a lot of a lot of time. I can't into stop thinking you. about it. Yeah, well, it Honestly. is your job. So <laughs> glad it's not my job. <laughs> How's your wrist going there? It's fine. <laughs> I can't feel my fingers. <laughs> I'd like to finish with this. Okay. Let's if, finish with this. Yeah. If you use Firefox or Chrome, uh, there's an organisation called Unpaywall, oh, which have created an extension. Um, it's It used to be called uh, OA something. It's now just called the Unpaywall extension. Go to the Google Apps or Firefox um, extension store, find it, download it, it's free. And what will happen is next time you're doing a Google Scholar search for a publication, when you click on the version of record, the you'll go to the publisher's website for that paper and if it's available as an open access object, a little overlay will appear on the right-hand side, which is a, like the, it's like a lock, and it'll be coloured, and you click on it, and you, if there's an open access, like a non-subscribed or free access version of that paper, that will open on screen. I am actually going to do a video about Unpayable, and you will be able to find it here somewhere, up here. Just click on the card. Um, I'm going to be doing that very, very soon, and putting up that up before this, probably. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> where we should end it. All right. For your thank arms' you. sake. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining me today, Em. It's been an absolute pleasure having you talk to us. I think it was a rant, but that's, I loved okay. every second <laughs> that's of it. Good. Um, hope you all found it useful. If you've got anything that you'd like to know about libraries, information, knowledge management, research, access, anything like that, 
uh, let me know in the comments below or hit me up on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Luke Bryan, and I will try to turn that into a video. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>